Yeah, that is one of the, the stereotypes that I think many of us who aren't familiar with the life of military personnel and veterans uh, have. We think um, um, the good things that, that veterans bring to the table are things such as the discipline, uh, the can-do attitude, the task orientation, the goal orientation. But of course, there are also some other aspects that often go unnoticed. Uh, I've heard other people say that, you know, the most difficult thing, uh, turning uh, uh, away from the military and entering a whole new world was uh, to organize myself. Um, I, uh, for a long time in my career, was told what to do, when to get up, when to get food, and now all of a sudden, I have to make all of those decisions myself. So these, uh, uh, these different uh, advantages and disadvantages, the challenges and the opportunities is what we're going to talk about today. Uh, and we have uh, two very exciting speakers here, but I'll leave it to my colleague, Nelson Pizarro, who is a professor in entrepreneurship here at CLU, to introduce the speakers and talk a little bit more about what we do in entrepreneurship at CLU. Nelson. Thank you. Good morning, Laila uh, my name is Nelson Pizarro, and I teach uh, entrepreneurship here. And I'm also a serial entrepreneur. I have a company called EcoStatic that we launched it, um, in May of last year. Um, before I introduce our guest speakers, I want to share with you uh, the next round table is building evaluation. And we have Melissa Silverman, who will be talking about ways of doing business evaluation. That uh, Entrepreneur Roundtable is going to be on November 21st. Uh, then we also have uh, the Jam, Jam to Creativity in, in Innovation. It's an event run by the Entrepreneurship Club here at uh, CLU. It's going to be on November 23rd. Uh, Robert, do you want to say a little bit about that? He's the president of the Entrepreneurship Club here at CLU. Sure, what we just want to do is basically spark entrepreneurs and spirit here at CLU and across campus and the local community as well. So we're just going to get about 100 people in a room, um, bring a social issue and identify a problem, and kind of work in teams and, and collaborate with individuals and to figure out solutions for this. And basically just going to be open to anybody and anyone who wants to be involved. And uh, we're starting promotion for that, and we would really love everyone to come out. And there's uh, flyers being passed around, as well as you can get in touch with myself or Nelson uh, for more information. We'd love to have you. Thank you. And finally, um, we are launching a program called Veterans Entrepreneurship Institute. And it is uh, uh, two courses. One is uh, entrepreneurial thinking and the other one is going to be a startup lab. Uh, the, the, the course will be, will be taught uh, starting January 18th, and it's going to be taught for 10 consecutive weeks or weekends. Uh, we have about 20 scholarships uh, for all veterans, and mainly we're going to focus on giving, giving the veterans um, tools to uh, either design a product or design a service, and to um, tools to think more entrepreneurial. So it, it will help them to pair with all these different uh, technical skills that they have. Okay, and then next I would like to introduce, uh, you know, we have a small group to, today, so maybe we're just gonna make a, I'm gonna let them introduce themselves, Jerry Nutz, that is a, a member of the community and CLU, and um, Bill Camarillo too. So please introduce yourself and thank you for coming, okay? Or you want us over here? Well, you, you probably you can use it there. Like Let me get my brain book so I don't okay. And I think, um, <laughs> is that a, can it's we a use CLU book, so that's okay. Yeah, we can, we can do it from there. Okay, fine. I'm Jerry Nods. How many veterans do we have in here? Okay, we may not need the mic. Good. Uh, I have to be the luckiest guy in the world. I spent 24 years in the Air Force doing fun stuff. One year it was a little terror, but I'll talk about that later. Uh, I'm a Penn State double E, uh, PE, electronics engineer, professional engineer. And when I uh, entered Penn State, I knew what I wanted to do. I wanted to be in the Air Force and fly. 
So I joined ROTC and graduated, got a commission, and went to flying school. And then after flying school, I taught for about a year, and I got tapped. Personnel, the sergeant personnel, when they call, as you know, you show up. So I left the, the platform I was teaching on, went over and talked to the sergeant and said, you're going to be reassigned. I said, I'm getting fired. I've only been here a year. He said, no, no, no. This is a special assignment, and you'll have to have some special clearances, so we've got to start the paperwork right now, and you only have an hour to do that, and you will be in Wiesbaden, Germany. And, of course, uh, I was a young lieutenant, and uh, that sounded pretty exciting to me. So I went back to the office and told the guys what I got, and they damn near killed me because they said they've been wanting for that assignment all the time, and we're talking majors, lieutenant colonels. So anyway, <clears throat> I got involved at that point in a very special program. I can tell you now without killing you. <laughs> uh, it was clandestine. We were flying airplanes to change configuration in flight. So oftentimes the tail numbers blew off on takeoff. And every now and then you land in an airport around the world and some guy that hadn't been alerted to stay away from our airplanes would come up and say, there's something wrong here. So what's wrong? He says, I was in the airplane with that tail number when it crashed. And I said, okay, you need a special briefing. So you take them over to the side and say, you repeat that to anybody and you will be facing a court martial. Because these airplanes were very special airplanes. So I got into that, flew for three years over there. We kept the quarters open into Berlin. We had a Berlin for lunch group that uh, had a very special airplane. It was uh, owned by a very uh, important three-letter agency back in Washington. And uh, this airplane, things came out the bottom, very special antennas, out of the wingtips, and on the side, a door opened, and there were cameras. So we had a lot of fun with the East Germans. I was back there two years ago, and we were on a cruise. We had a, what we called our spook reunion in Berlin. Had 40 guys who had been serving together over there. We were never allowed to go into the east because we'd have been invited to Lubyanka. You know what Lubyanka is? That's a very famous prison in Moscow. And uh, we had a couple of visitors there that we all knew. So they were one of the guys had just come in from a river cruise in Moscow, and they said, "Well, we were." going down the boat and all of a sudden uh, some of the other people on there were Russian officers, flyers. And they came up and then, you know, you start exchanging war stories and all this stuff. And they said, were you in the photo bird or the electronic bird? So they really knew what we were doing. And they tramp in the snow, Merry Christmas to our squadron, and we're shooting <laughs> pictures of this stuff. And, you know, if you got out of the quarter, if you hit the quarter, we had airplanes shot down. They really got shot down. Colonel May came over one time in a T-39 was shot down. And he said uh, to the sink, you say, four star, he said, the next time it goes down, your butt better be on it. That was his farewell speech. Anyway, we had a lot of fun. Now, the whole thing is, I'm an engineer. Well, you know, when you go into service, you may or not have any ties to what you just got educated on. You, the fact that you have a degree allowed you to get a commission. Well, I was very fortunate because I ended up being the one in charge of the configuration of the systems. And then uh, when that tour was over, Vietnam was going on. So you had a choice. You could vote with your feet or you could go to Vietnam. So I decided not to vote with my feet. I was having too much fun. So we picked out a mission that I thought would be really challenging and career enhancing. It was called the Wild Weasel. Now, if you haven't seen that on the suicide missions on, on TV, watch it. We had a 35% probability of survival, and we kept flunking our sanity test by keeping flying. We were flying up north. Our mission was to take out the surf steer missile sites before the strike force came in. And we had to stay in there <coughs> while they were there. And we had one missile. And we had a 20 millimeter cannon. That was it. So your objective was to go get them to fire at you so you could find them and then attack them and take them out. And some of us did survive. 
of an example. And I kept flunking my sanity test. And when we got to 112, I said, I did 13 once, that's it. So, but what I was doing on the side was an engineer again. I was now responsible for the systems and the airplanes. And I worked with tech reps that come over with special equipment to do some special stuff up there trying to uh, continue the air war successfully. Well, after that, I went back into the program that ran the operation in Europe. So, you know, all this time, you're thinking, what am I going to do in civil life when I go, you know, get out of the service? And up until the time you make major, which is about 10-year point, why, you're thinking, do you want to stay? Because that's a decision point. Once you hit 10 years and you become a major, then you're pretty much going to commit yourself to stick around. So, at least that's the way we felt. So uh, I said I'll stick around, but I had no idea because the correlation between civil life and military life was quite a bit different. And we had all these programs. So every now and then, on an annual basis, they pull everybody together and say, okay, we're going to talk about how you transition from the military to civilian life. And they had no clue, except for one thing they always told us. And that continued on way up later in my career. First thing they mentioned was, if you stay till retirement, we will guarantee you will not be alive in five years after the day you retire. That's a real invitation to stay, isn't it? He said, what are you going to do, shoot me? He says, no, the average life of a, of a retired military person is five years. And it's based on the four, and it still stands, by the way, it's based on the four crisis theory. The first crisis is you're leaving something you know to something you have no clue. The second thing is you're moving from the town you know to a place you may not know at all. The third thing is probably going to be a divorce. The fourth thing is unknown, but if it happens, you're dead. So it says you better manage your life and you better get with it. And there's all kinds of programs that are available, and they still are, where you transition, and it's called career transition. And they teach you how, and they, you know, they try to introduce you and teach you about networking and all that stuff. Sometimes it works. And, but you see, like I said, I was the luckiest guy in the world. Where did I go? After I came back from Vietnam, my first assignment is in the plant in General Dynamics, Fort Worth, Texas. I used to get a kick out of my aunt. She says, you graduated from college, first one in the family on my father's side, and when are you going to get a real job? Because that was the perception of the civilians. They thought military, that's not a job. Yeah, you're getting paid, but that's really not a job. So they, she and her, my uncle, came to Fort Worth, Texas, and they visited. So I said, well, I'll set up a plant tour. At that time, we were building the F-111s. I wasn't connected with the F-111s. We had another hangar. You go to GD4 work, and you drive in, you pass the one mile long plant that has a 50-foot aisle in it. That's where the production is now. The, I think the, uh, not the 35, but the other one, 22. And they built the F-16s while I was there also. We had another hangar straight ahead, and that was closed. That was a, our skunk works in there. And uh, so I got them a tour of the big plant and showed them what was going on and drove them around the hangar. We had the hangar doors. We only opened those at night but uh, the hangar doors were closed so they couldn't see in, but we had some airplanes on the ramp. And uh, I never got challenged again about what I was, why don't I get a job? Because the airplanes there, we had five people in that office, and when you walked in there, I was a captain then, you were in charge of the program, to the point. You negotiated the contract, you managed the, the build, you were involved in the design of the systems, and you went to Washington to get the money from the Pentagon. And my boss and I used to have a contest. We'd meet in the Pentagon in the morning, and by noon, I had to have the money and he had the tail rope for a new project. Unfortunately, oftentimes by one o'clock, he lost the airplane. I had the money, but we lost the airplane, so we had to go get another airplane. But it was a lot of fun. Boy, engineering it. Now, is there a transition? I'm starting to work with industry. I went on from there to East Systems in Greenville, Texas, and then Went back to the headquarters, went out, left, they released me for a year, so I went and got my master's at Auburn, MBA. Came back and continued that job until I get 
promoted out of it. Where do I go? I'm the commander of 10 Allison uh, plants in Indianapolis, Indiana. That plant was Detroit Diesel Allison. They make all the transmissions for the Army. Anything that has a track were made there, including the, I was on the ground floor building the transmission for the M1 tank, which is about three times the size of this table. And at that time was $250,000, it's now much more, like two million. And I built engines for a bunch of airplanes, P3s, a bunch of the Navy airplanes, the A7, the C-130s. So I'm back in industry again. After that, I got, again, got promoted. Back to Washington. This time, I'm now the chief contracting officer in Washington for the Air Force in a program, in an operation I commanded, which is now called the Air Force District of Washington. I was responsible for four hospitals, three bases, everything from the Azores to St. Louis, north and south. I had a team of 100. Any construction that was done in Washington at that time was done by the Air Force in my office. And if you think you can move a twig on a tree in Washington, I got news for you. They have a lot of committees that you have to go through to do that. Again, we had one I, I helped initiate in Washington for the GIs there, because I had 100 guys working for me. A transition program. We started with what? The four crises. Make sure they understand. You've got to pay attention. But then the people working for me were contracting officers. They had talents that were universally accepted. In fact, I got a lot of them jobs. They decided they were getting out of the service. They could transition piece of cake because they were, they were uh, warranted contracting officers, even the GIs. They were sergeants and that, but they were still warranted. So they were well-trained in, in acquisition. And uh, I was uh, thinking about, well, I've had four years there. It's time to, time to move. And they said, well, we want you to go to Boston to take another purple suit job. Purple suit was like Indianapolis. That means you're working for the Department of Defense agency. You're not working for the Air Force. And then when I was the commander of the plans in Indianapolis, that's the case. They were going to move me to Boston. My wife says, it snows in Boston. <laughs> well, what was really neat, again, like I said, very fortunate, during the time I was a commander in Indianapolis, and the time I was a commander in Washington, on weekends, I would fly back to California and as a consultant to a company we were creating in Woodland Hills with the Air Force blessing. It's your weekend, do what you want. It's good salaries. I had two salaries, nice. So I helped create a division for California Microwave in Woodland Hills. Well, what do you think? Come time to retirement, guess what? At my retirement ceremony, which was in the presidential hangar, you know, with that great big flag that, that Reagan stood behind all the time, and uh, in my back pocket was my first paycheck. So when I did my final salute, I was employed. I had, that was called the 20 nanosecond retirement, and I haven't retired since. So I ran that out of operation over the Hills for three years. Again, what did I do? I was hired GIs. I had four colonels working for me, plus a bunch of other people that I picked up along the way, a couple of contracting um, sergeants that worked for me in Washington. And we brought them in, and the whole operation was 90% military, because all the jobs were military. So we wanted people who knew that. And after that, I came in as a, a senior vice president of uh, American Nucleonics, which is now ITT, and they just closed. And did that for a while, and then I went on my own. I had seven companies over my lifetime that I helped create and then ran, and uh, run four foundations. In my free time, I worked with Nelson and Gerhard and uh, Valeria. So uh, the whole thing with the GIs is there is now more so a tie-in between the military and the civilian. Used to be no, there was no tie-in. With technology being so advanced and its movement so fast, there's no GI that's not involved in technology in some manner. And whenever these GIs are getting close to leaving the service for whatever reason, sitting down with them and working the transition is really not the challenge it used to be. You know, 
and you're a war fighting machine, it's very difficult to say, yeah, I'm going to go to work for IBM. They've got a combat they need help with. No. Quite a transition. But the transition today is not quite as difficult. Thank you. If you don't mind, I'd like to stand so I can see everybody. And uh, can you all hear me even in the back? Good. Um, my military career was a little different. Um, I knew from the age of 12 I wanted to be an entrepreneur. I borrowed my uncle's lawnmower, his gasoline, I mowed lawns, made money, and kept the money. It was a pretty good deal because I didn't have to pay for the lawnmower or the gasoline. So at a very young age, I realized that the best business in the world was one in which you could sell things that were free. Um, pretty much doesn't get better than that until 10 years out of the Marine Corps, I found a better one. So all along the way, I knew that that's what I wanted to become. So I couldn't quite figure out my pathway. I grew up in Ventura County, uh, in El Rio, graduated from Rio Mesa High School, did very well in high school. So I was uh, offered to go to West Point at a couple of scholarships. Um, I ended up uh, taking Cal State Northridge engineering program, spent about two years there. I didn't take West Point, I had a girlfriend. <laughs> didn't have parents that could guide me very well. Um, didn't want to spend nine, ten years in the military. So I thought, oh, this is a good gig, it's down the road, it's free, I can become an engineer, I'm sure that'll help me get where I want to go, I'll have a skill. So about two years into it of driving back and forth from Ventura County to Northridge, working, having a girlfriend, this wasn't going so well at the age of 18, 19 years old, I'm thinking this, there's got to be a better way to get there. So I went back to the military, went into Oxnard to the recruiter's office, and there they were, Navy, Army, Marine Corps, Air Force, Coast Guard. Young kid walking down the halls going, which uniform do I want to wear? <laughs> which is going to be the toughest, which was going to challenge me the best? So I picked the elite group, the small group. Everybody said, are you crazy? That's a tough gig over there. Um, and I liked the uniform, so I picked the Marine Corps. So I spent the next 10 years getting <coughs> married, having a family, being a Marine, going to college every night, having a part-time job. And I was able to get four degrees by the time 10 years had passed to include my MBA, all in business and technology. So 10 years, like you said, was my break point. Am I going to stay or am I going to go? I'm 28 years old. If I'm going to become an entrepreneur, I better make hay. I think the world would take me serious at the age of 28, not at 24. So I decided to get out, still not knowing what I was going to do. So I joined up with some high school friends of mine who were in the uh, tree trimming business for Southern Cal Edison who had a waste problem. Every time they trimmed trees, they had to throw away their chips, their wood chips, and it cost money to do so. So we had found a way to take those chips, recycle them, and send them to the burn plants where they could create electricity, and we got paid for it. So I was like, holy crap, I found something free again that I could get somebody to pay me for that we were paying to get rid of. And that was in 1990. I got out in 92, so I helped start the business before I was out, and then I couldn't wait to get out. And I was gonna get to come back home and join a couple of high school friends to start this business. Today it's called Agriment. And uh, I am the CEO of Ackerman. Ackerman's a 41-year-old company, soils company, that in 1993 I transformed into an organics recycling company. Today, Ackerman recycles over 400,000 tons a year of organic waste from Santa Maria all the way through Orange County. Because of the large population in Southern California, it makes us the largest organics recycler in the state of California and the eighth largest in the United States. Today we make over 200 different types of products from the organic waste stream and we sell it as energy still today, electricity. We are now uh, converting it into methane gas for transportation fuels that go back in buses and trucks and cars. And we also continue to make a lot of soil care products that go back to agriculture and they go into landscapes that you see here at the college. And they end up in retail stores like Home Depot and Target and 99 cent only stores. So <clears throat> that transition for me in the military was pretty clear. And I'd like to uh, comment on what Gerhardt said earlier because I didn't realize what was happening to me when I got out. I didn't have someone to explain to me what I was feeling uh, when I got out because I did get out and then the world was bright white. 
there was no rules anymore. I didn't have to be somewhere five minutes early and uh, listen to someone tell me what to do. I could actually decide what I was going to do for myself. So the whole challenge for me was trying to learn how to structure and organize myself to lead a company. Um, my partners were just hardworking, tree trimming guys that did very well, working very hard, and I was the educated one. Um, and they were looking to me to try and lead the company, and I was, as a Marine, said, no problem, I'm used to doing that. Cutting through a forest, not really knowing where you're going, everybody's following you. And you have to pretend like you know where you're going, or else they lose faith, they lose confidence. So as I learned to cut through the forest in our own business, it's the equivalent of walking through a, a corn maze that's not cut out for you, and you have to get to the other side. And you hope you're going in the right direction without a compass. So you have to be quick on your feet. You've got to make decisions. You have to have good critical thinking skills. You've got to be a great leader. Great leaders that I define are people who can get others to do things and then want to do it. And by being able to do that, they will follow you, and through sheer determination, you somehow find your way to the other side. Because as you know, life isn't easy, and it throws you lots of curveballs. So after uh, 20 years of being in business today, our company is growing at a very rapid rate across the United States of recycling organic waste. And I did find a business that <coughs> does one better than one in which you sell things that are free. We get paid to take the organic waste we convert it into energy and soil products, and then we sell those products. So through my business background, which I loved, and every one of my degrees was in business, I believe that it was a science. So I found a common thread between military, education, and business. And because of this program, it made me reflect on the 10 years I had in the Marine Corps and all the benefits I took from it. I never once looked to being a veteran as a benefit. When I got out, I ran as fast as I could. I thought that the world looked as vets, like you said, or maybe people that didn't do anything, or people that went there because they weren't educated, or I didn't see that there was any benefit to me being a veteran other than all of the tools that I got when I left. All the leadership tools, um, the can-do attitude, the um, the ability to um, be flexible, the critical thinking, all those things were taught and they became part of my life and the military did that for me. The constant repetition of doing things, the forced failure is basically what they were doing is to keep you alive. In the military they said our job is to teach you to stay alive, not die for your country, make someone else die for theirs. So in business, competition is all about outdoing the next business. In any space that you're in, you're trying to find that value proposition of doing one better. And I think coming from the military it allows you to be an um, outside-the-box thinker once you add the business science to what we're doing as an entrepreneur. I recently found out that I'm considered a vetpreneur. I don't know if you knew that, but uh, <laughs> the uh, Entrepreneur Magazine has called us vetpreneurs. I thought it was pretty cool. Um, and it's basically the uh, ability to start enterprises using the military background of determination and critical thinking to build businesses. And I have been building this business now, like I said, for, for the last 20 years, and we employ well over 120 people across the country, and we definitely give preference to military personnel that come on board because they do come with a great structure, worth ethic to uh, help our company grow. So that's kind of my story. All right, thank you. Well, thank you. Everybody's so young. How many Vietnam vets are here? Okay. Uh, what people never, well, people today don't realize that when you were coming back from Vietnam as a soldier, or I don't care what your uniform was, the first thing was you weren't wearing it. You were not welcome and you were told, do not wear your uniform when you're coming back home. Because it was not in vogue. And you probably would get stoned or something else. I mean, the, the people were pretty violent. So today, what happens? You go to the airport, what do you see? A lot of cabbies. I don't care what the service is, they're all wearing cabbies. 
those are the uniforms today. And they're showing up and they're there. And that is a major, major change. Now, think about the psyche of the person that was told you can't wear your uniform when you go back home. And now you're going to transition to civilian life. What's the first thing you're thinking about? Am I welcome there? Do I dare tell them I was in the military? Will I help people and advise them about their resumes? You never mentioned military in your resume. You did not mention it because there were so many people with biases. You had to drag it out of them. I, I created the engineering team that was at American Nucleonics and I interviewed a bunch of the veterans because I had preference obviously for them and they were all technical people, either technicians or engineers. And uh, I had to drag it out of them that they, were, they had military experience, which was pretty key because he described exactly right the discipline, the thought process, the logical train of thought that goes on. It's not random. And you look for that in a person when you want to hire them, and especially in a technical area where I was working. And you wanted to have the trust in the fact that they could think like that and not walk down the home, walk into the wall. But it was very different back then, and people have forgotten it. But those of us who were there didn't forget it. Of course, we were a lot lighter. I used to work one time. <laughs> I lost 35 pounds the first week in Vietnam. I think it was between fear and sweat. When you're flying up north, you dump the pressurization. I was flying in 405. You dump the pressurization, and, and uh, we carried water bottles. But you know, if you have a water bottle like this, ours were baby bottles. And I thought, what an idiot. Back then, look, <laughs> you talk about entrepreneurship, I should be shot for being so stupid. We had, you had four baby bottles, you filled it, and I took the nipples off. And you threw them in the freezer, and in the morning, before you're going to go fly, you put two at each leg of the flight suit. And they're rock solid. You know, you carry a 45, you got a flak vest on, you got all kinds of survival stuff, the parachute, you get the airplane, you can't even move because you don't have any movement. But you got those water bottles in your hand and you pump it, you connect up your, your uh, speed jeans, which is our uh, G suit, and go fast hat and speed jeans. The go fast hat, I still have my helmet, but uh, you connect up that and you could be flying in that airplane you can't even move in for about six or seven hours. The convenience was there's a little button you press on it and the G-suit inflates. So you get a massage so at least the blood doesn't go away in your legs and your gut. And it, when you come off the targets and you're really sweating because you have no pressurization and it's hotter than hell because there's no air conditioning in that. You can't put it back on because if you get hit, it fills with smoke, you can't see what you're doing, you can't open a canopy, it's going to be gone. You grab one of those water bottles and unscrew that cap and it's already starting to thaw. And wow, it's like scotch. <laughs> <coughs> Fun stuff. All right. So um, I want to open the floor for questions. Um, questions and also any additional comments or, or suggestions or ideas. Uh, from the veterans and the, and, the, and the audience, that would be nice to share too. So, any questions? You know, we have an initiative. Let me add something. We have an initiative going on in the valley right now, or in the in the uh, county. There's the chief of it, and uh, it's on uh, unmanned aerial vehicles. It's in my blood. Uh, we used to meet in uh, San Diego as part of a program in a hotel room with the water running, the radio blasting, the TV on with three people. And it, at that time it was a DARPA program and it had one name to it. If you have a program in the military that has one name, that means it is top secret plus. This was top secret plus three categories. And it was a program now, I can tell you, it's called AMBER. You know it as the Predator. That original vehicle was designed by an Israeli, American citizen, 
Israeli engineer. He designed everything but the rubber and the tires from scratch. And it was unbelievable. And that was a fun world. That was part of a program that uh, the Secretary of the Navy made a visit. Lehman was Secretary of the Navy then. He made a visit to Israel. Uh, the U.S. Air Force had gotten out of the drone business just after uh, Vietnam. And we had the Ryan Firebees, and uh, they were flying in and out of Vietnam with working with Magoo and the Navy. And we had uh, we had helicopters that would recover them. They would be equipped with either jammers or cameras, electronic Elan collection, and they would fly in and out. And when they ran out of gas, then the Navy would come in with a helicopter and catch them in flight and uh, recover them, re refuel them, put uh, launch them off of C-130 wings. Got out of that business and went for a long time because the Air Force pilots had a blue scarf theory. You do anything that doesn't have a pilot, that's a threat to your career. Okay, it's like the airlines now. Well, a long delay, and up comes this trip that Laban took to Israel. Now the reason I'm telling you these stories is to show you how it melts. There's no differentiation now between the civilian and the military except the uniform. Because the military, I know Eisenhower made some fun of this, the military industrial complex is your life. Especially what it was in Southern California until uh, the state got crazy with Lockheed. We had the skunk works over here, that was part of our group. We had Lockheed, Ontario. I had a whole bunch of stuff in there. It was 1.30. That's now moved to Texas. Uh, Burbank is closed. And I now moved up in the high desert, and that's not doing well. And all the stuff down here in L.A. was crazy. So it was really wild stuff. But it was so close. The guy sitting next to you, the guy <coughs> sitting next to you. And by the way, there are a lot of Gal engineers, and more so that, which were really great. You couldn't tell the difference until somebody raised their hand and said so. Oh, you have a question? Yeah, I have a question for Bill. Um, what's some advice you would give for looking and searching and analyzing for opportunities within the organic waste industry? I'm not going to help you there, but I can help you with something else. <laughs> <laughs> you know what a build competition? Yeah, I need another competitor. Yeah. <laughs> the one thing about business that you learn in economics is anytime there's a lot of profit, you'll have a lot of competitors. It's just supply and demand, right? So you'll have them all migrating that direction. So being in the military, I learned how to use decoys. So I'm going to give you one of those. Um, but um, basically, what's happening in our industry right now is, I'm going to give you some stats. There was an assembly bill in 1990, AB 939, that required us to take 50% of the waste out of the landfills. Well, it just so happens that organics were 40% of the waste stream total so it, was, it would have been pretty easy to get there but the industry focused on cans bottles plastic and paper well empty of water it's going to weigh too much right so they were like wow how are we going to get there we can't even get the 25 percent taking those things out and here i am jumping up and down in the background nobody wants to pay attention to me one of my challenges was getting out of the marine corps diplomacy i was used to people taking orders and do what i told them well here i'm talking to politicians like they're Marines, and that wasn't very good, so I have done. Organics are 30% of the waste stream. I can help you get there, and nobody paid attention. Well, it took a little while for them to come around like my kids. And about 10 years in, when the deadline was coming up, they went, hey, anybody remember that Bill Camarillo guy? We need to talk to him, because we're not going to make it. And that was a $10,000 a day fine for every city. So all of a sudden, I became popular. and. Um, they started the first greenways program in the city of Ventura. I thought it was really smart, and I was going to take their stuff and their money, and I was going to make energy out of it and send it to the power plants, and lo and behold, grass, leaves, and branches don't burn. So I had to get real smart in a hurry, and that's how I came upon Agriman and said, is there anything you could do with this stuff? And we, at that time, learned how to blend the material into all 200 of his products until we screwed them up. And then we backed off, and that was, that was kind of how we got to go through. So in our industry today, what's happening is Assembly Bill 32, the greenhouse gas bill, is requiring organics to be taken out of landfills by 2017. 
there isn't enough infrastructure in the state of California to manage it all. It's about 13 million tons. And I told you we do 400,000. So trucks and facilities and grinders and people and knowing what to do with it and markets. The marketing side right now is the real big opportunity. What could you make out of the organic waste stream to capture the nutrients and the minerals in it and sell it as a soil care product <coughs> that ends up in a bag or in a landscape? Or even now today, we're using uh, products like biochar being created by Cool Planet Biofuels out of Camarillo and learning how to use that with our product to do stormwater management. Basically bioremediation and cleaning up water. So big opportunities, you just have to start researching it and realizing you will be taking market share from someone. And that is kind of the biggest thing you'll learn from the military also is understand your enemy. You know, bandages, beans and bullets. You've got to go size them up. In our business, how many trucks do they have? How many people, how many grinders? How long can they last if I shove too much stuff down their throat, you know, or if I take it away, or if I raise prices, or if I lower prices? You have all these levers you learn in business, and they're all pretty important to manipulate, so. Um, the big difference that I see between the military today and being an entrepreneur is there is no pay ceiling as an entrepreneur. A lot more risk, but there's no pay ceiling. A lot of security over here. So what I see in military guys as they get out is they're used to having structure like that. And what I tell them is the world is your apple, so you just have to figure out how to go get it. There's a lot of risk that goes with it. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? No, that main thing is, oh. I've got a question. Uh, my name's Chris. Thank you both for your service. Thank you both for taking the time to come out here and speak this morning. Um, uh, I'm, I'm interested in understanding what your opinions are on the responsibility of universities and communities in addressing the individual needs of veterans as they come back from the wars and how to facilitate them into these positions to become entrepreneurs. What, what do you think the main, you know, I mean there's no one need to, to blanket the entire country, but how should universities be responsible in their relationship with communities and addressing the needs of veterans and facilitating them into these positions to become entrepreneurs? Well, I'd be happy to start that one. Um, I came out of the uh, first of the storm war, and I, I helped to the Gold Coast Veterans Foundation, and we're part of a lot of veteran centers that are on the university campuses, like Channel Islands and here at uh, Cal Lutheran. And, I think the word responsibility is a big word. Um, I think their initiatives to help veterans are important, but they aren't responsible for helping them. Uh, the military's responsibility of helping you transition is where the responsibility lies. And with the GI Bill today, and the way it is designed, it is extremely helpful to helping veterans get educated. And I think that in order for you to compete in a business world as an entrepreneur, you have to shed the fact that you were a veteran and you have to make the transition. You have to jump yourself because it's, it's something you have to do internally, just like I did. It took a while. It probably took five, ten years for me to finally meld in and go, okay, I get it now. I get how this works. I have to compete like a sport. So you go from this world where you have to compete to stay alive to a world where you're competing to make money. And entrepreneurs are visionary. So you have to open your mind and be visionary, and you have to lead your people down the road as an entrepreneur. Do, do you think, though, um, what this gentleman was saying about the crises and that, do you think that there's a higher risk or a potential for escalating that crisis coming from a world of survival and jumping into another world of survival, except for the one you came from was literally life or death? Now, this one's not life or death, but how, how is that perception translated? Because coming from a life or death situation into one that appears to be life or death from an economic standpoint, how do you, you know, that's where I'm worrying about the responsibilities of universities and the, and the psychology field and the, the community to address those needs because translating from a life or death situation to one where it's very competitive, could that trigger the crisis to escalate? Well, uh, first of all, the competitiveness exists much stronger in the military than it does in civilian life. 
like you said, you've got a ceiling, and that ceiling can be penetrated through competition. But you're, you're selected for your next promotion. Very, very strict rules for competition. You know, they wrote all kinds of new laws about that. DOFMA was one of them. But let's go back to the responsibility. I absolutely agree with what he said. There is no responsibility in the part of universities, cities, or any other organization to do anything like that. You have to look at it from the business standpoint. It's a tremendous opportunity for the universities and the cities to help the veterans. And I think uh, having a veterans organization like we have in Ventura County, which is very, very effective, and the one he mentioned, plus we have a staff out there that, that handles veterans affairs, and they're doing a magnificent job. That's kind of a service. I wouldn't say it's a responsibility, I wouldn't say it's an obligation, I would say that it's a service provided uh, for the benefit of the community. And the target is the veteran to, especially now, and I, I think that, uh, we talk about Vietnam, I wasn't in the, the Gulf War, I built the airplanes for them, and my airplane's still flying over there. But the whole thing there is, these kids are facing a world I couldn't describe. In Vietnam, we, we knew who the enemy was. I don't know how in the world you determine the enemy. You're walking down the street of the city and somebody blows you up. And uh, one, one of the major uh, contributions that uh, ANC did was they had the anti-IED equipment to let the stuff go off before you to hurt you. And that's how they made all their billions. But anyway, uh, the transition of the military, the veteran, into civilian life is good for the community as a service. It's beneficial. You're providing a new value to that individual. And uh, a lot of these kids are coming back, and it's scary for them because they don't know when they're walking down the city, they haven't transitioned to the safe point yet. In the Air Force, it's nice and convenient. We're flying above it. Yeah, we get shot down, and we get shot at, and we had holes in everything. But we weren't walking down the street not knowing if somebody's going to get me in, in an instant. At least I know I had to go into harm's way to get there. They're in harm's way every second of the day. So the cities are waking up, uh, and I believe, you know, this university programs that are coming out are magnificent because they're saying we have a resource that's untapped, that needs to be uh, worked with to create a new value to the world, and in this case, the community, and that's the value of that program. It is not an obligation from that sense. I think it's a very kind operation. These are, most of these programs are supported by grants, and those grants are really a value. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? Jerry, is there a, um do you guys post uh, the veterans' uh, CVs when you can, when they come back? Is there some place we can go and look for? Oh yeah, uh, we can give you the name of the, uh, the the veterans affairs guy that works for the county, and he has a whole staff that does that. And plus, I imagine that organization does it. You mentioned Broke Veterans Foundation. Yeah. But you know, there's 308 million people in the U.S. And Roughly 1% of the population serves in the military. So you're competing in a business world. So you get you get the military, and then you have the business world, totally driven through capitalism. It's all about succeeding. So you have to take the tools you learned in the military of succeeding and competition, and you have to be educated. So there's like a Venn diagram, military, education, and business, and you have to connect all three Learn the science of business if that's what you want to do. Take the skills you've gotten and realize that you have an advantage. Because people that just get an education and go into business are lacking all of these tools that you were paid to learn. Leadership, the ability to improvise, overcome, and adapt. Your higher tolerance to risk. Think about entrepreneurship and look at it. It's all about risk. Calculated risk. And your ability to critical think and your determination not to quit. So many people lose in business because they give up. 
And what I find in military guys is they don't quit. I have, to my detriment, <laughs> have done things where I just refuse to lose as the money just kept chipping away. Going, God dang it, I gotta make this work. 100,000, 200,000, 300,000, 400,000, it just, and they're like, Bill, stop. I'm gonna make it work. Because 80% of the time, I fix them. But there is that 20% that's painful that you don't fix and you have to finally say, I lost that one. So getting back to responsibility, it's yours. Use the tools you were given and the opportunities that are available and leverage them. Okay, great. We have another Hi. question. My name's Jim. Uh, Jerry and I know each other well. I'm an ROTC graduate. Uh, my background is I worked in um, uh, for a big pharmaceutical company for 30 years. And I want to address your, your comments over there is I think uh, what you get is you get a responsibility to yourself first. And once you have that responsibility to yourself and that ethic is that's what carries you into the rest of the world. Okay, that's the first part. The second part is what's the role in the responsibility or commitment of the educational world? I think the answer to that is that they want their veterans to succeed, they want their students to succeed. But really the answer is that the community has to be made self-aware of this 1% of their population that has military service. And they have to be brought into the picture through community awareness. And you don't see that happen most of the time, okay? So where's the responsibility? The responsibility is with politicians and community leaders that don't want to cultivate the, the, the military because, because, in my opinion, humbly, it's not in their best interest. I love your bend up there. Uh, you know, the one thing, you pointed out most significantly, the percentage of the population that's in the military today. Think about it, as opposed to World War II. Oh. <clears throat> and then you say, if you were in business, and I work with a lot of entrepreneurs, I've mentored all kinds of companies, from pharma to biotech, they're all over the place. High tech, low tech, and no tech. Uh, when you look at that as your population, and you came to me and said, I have a fantastic idea, and my market is 1%, I'd say, next. Yeah, that's the point I made. It's not worth looking at. But these are individuals. They're not products. Right. And these individuals can create things that multiply. They grow jobs. They grow businesses. That's yeah. why it's worthwhile to make the investment. Jahar, you have a question? Yeah, I just wanted to suggest a, a CLU actually has a veterans coordinator and she's yeah, in the room. Maybe, yeah. maybe Jane, you could say a few words about what yeah. we do and how we live up to our responsibility. Right. Um, so I'm Jen Zimmerman. I'm the veterans coordinator here on campus. And um, I'm an alumni here. And I came um, to CLU and I found that the services weren't so great for veterans. And I set out to change that. And CLU has valued that. They they looked at it and they're like, we we value our veterans and we want to invest in them and see them become successful graduates and in turn go out into the community and make a difference for, you know, the entire population and everywhere. So, you know, CLU's been really great doing that. And we have fifty thousand veterans in Ventura County alone. Um, so we're out here and it's just a matter of reaching out to us and um, I play a big role. I feel it's my responsibility to get these veterans that are coming straight out of the military because it's a really confusing time. I had a really weird experience. It just, you're lost for a while. And, you know, it, it takes a long time. I've been out for six years now and I'm finally starting to feel I'm a civilian now and now I can make a difference with others. So I, I feel it's my responsibility to help the ones that are coming out now to get them through school, help them find their purpose and their direction, and connect them with these community partners. And so I feel like I'm the, the hub of it all. So I enjoy it and I love it. And so I'm the one, if you want a list of veterans on campus, I can get it for you, kind of thing. So.
Do you have a question? I think this is the last question. Okay. Uh, Bill, I'm wondering with all this um, provision of organics in the future and having to turn this turn these organic materials into something to do with it, either more waste or more product. Um, have you thought of micro remediation uh, also as a food source, meaning using mushrooms to use that organic waste to also break it down but provide a food source uh, and use that food source as a protein rich source in a country where protein, where mostly it's animal sources, is declining as populations dramatically increasing. Um, have you thought of doing something like that? That's a great question. <laughs> Along with that one over there. Um, yes, we just joined up with uh, John Todd Ecological. Uh, had no idea who they were. Showed up in Thousand Oaks, moved from Boston, Massachusetts. And this guy comes in who's a crazy scientist, biologist person saying, hey, I need your help. We are trying to solve waterway issues. One of them right here, Malibu Creek, too much phosphorus going into the ocean. And those nutrients have to be captured, right? So they're generated by population or cattle, animals. So one of the solutions is living plants, mushrooms, long-rooted plants to fix and capture nutrients so they don't make their way into the waterway. So that just this year, we are looking at ways of managing stormwater, which is a big deal that the CETA fought as MS4 where all facilities now have to capture their stormwater and turning these landscapes into concave landscapes to convex landscapes mm -hmm. so that we can put bioswale materials in there that will take the first two inches of stormwater, capture the minerals and nutrients before they get into the sewer system into the ocean. So mushrooms are becoming a big way of using fungi to take up nutrients and solve the problem. But what about turning that into a primary food source for a community? I haven't taken that step, so give me a call. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, sounds good. Thank you very much. Got a new entrepreneur here. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> definitely. Thank, Thank you very you. much.